Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary, uh, January 28th, 2021. Welcome. And uh, I understand that some of you were thinking we hadn't gone live at exactly nine o'clock. Those of you who are used to watching us in the State House know because people are walking down hallways and getting stopped by folks, we're usually 10 minutes late. So actually, I'd say we're a little early today. So we're going to get started. Uh, this morning, we're taking up S18, which is a bill that deals with uh, limiting earned good time sentence reductions for offenders convicted of certain crimes. Our witness this morning is Meg McCarthy, a concerned citizen. And uh, welcome, Meg, to Senate Judiciary. My name's Dick Sears. I'm the chair of the committee. I reside in Bennington County, uh, but I also represent the town of Wilmington and Wyndham County. Um, I, my view, so what, Senator Benning, maybe you could introduce yourself and then Senator Baruth, White, and Nick. You're muted, Joe. I'm Joe Benning. I represent the Caledonia District. And I'm Phil Baruth. I represent Chittenden County. Alice Nitka. I represent towns, all towns in Windsor County, plus Mount Holly and um, Londonderry, which are out of, um, well, out of mm. Windsor County. Sorry. Hi, Meg. Hi, Jeanette. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you two know each other. Uh, we do. Okay, Meg. Well, welcome to Senate Judiciary and uh, we appreciate your coming forward and uh, discussing this bill that would limit earned good time to certain offenders. Please feel free to get started on whatever you'd like to tell us. Okay, so my name is Meg McCarthy. Um, I'm here today. First of all, I want to say I have my notes. I'm probably going to read a lot and I apologize for that, but I don't think there's any way I would get everything I wanted to say out without doing so. Um, I'm here today representing families of incarcerated people, and I'm also representing my husband. I've been, also been an advocate since my husband was incarcerated nearly 10 years ago. I worked with Representative Susie Wizawadi when she became BCJR and was on their board of directors up until Tom Dalton became director. My husband is one of the people who will lose earned good time if S-18 goes through. He has seven and a half years left to his sentence. He has the possibility of shortening that by a year and a half with good time. While incarcerated, he has done volunteer work as a head librarian, and he also works as a coach in the Open Ears program. I don't know if you're familiar with the Open Ears program. Do you know what yes, that is? I, yeah, I think we all are. We've had uh, visits to... There is, um, I think Springfield is where we heard more about it. Yes, well, Springfield is where he is uh, residing right now, and that's where he works as a counselor there. When he's released, he would like to work with uh, formerly incarcerated people, ment mentoring them, um, who may be at more risk when they get released, and it's his way of making amends. Crime victims prefer prevention over punish, punishment. Studies have shown that victims would rather resources go into prevention than long prison sentences. Funds that are saved by letting low risk people in this category earn good time can be spent on education, drug and alcohol addiction treatment, mental health, all the things that shown uh, to be a factor in crime. More than half of the incarcerated population in Vermont will be left out of good time if this bill passes. The DOC population report at the end of 2020 indicates that roughly 800 of the slightly less than 300 incarcerated people fall into the categories that would be left out of good time. Leaving violent offenders out of criminal justice reforms limits its effectiveness. Nationwide, people locked up for violent offenses are, as in Vermont, the largest group. The goal of criminal justice reform is to limit the use of prison while at the same time keeping communities safe. The goal of the DOC is to support inmates in rehabilitation and in becoming better citizens. 
part of that support might be allowed letting those serving time for violent acts prove themselves as good citizens while behind bars and therefore worthy to join the rest of us again. Earned good time doesn't automatically mean a person is released when he or she reaches their minimum minus good time earned. It means that they may be considered for parole. The parole board's job is to release only low risk people. The people that are in this group have been in prison long enough and the DOC knows who they are. Those incarcerated for murder and other violent crimes are the least likely to reoffend and even less likely to be incarcerated for the same crime. I know this to be true of my husband and there are exception, exceptions to everything, but I believe it to be true for most of those incarcerated in Vermont. Telling them they are not worthy to earn good time is to tell them we believe them incapable of changing and bettering themselves. I believe the Justice Reinvestment Committee understood what they were doing when they recommended that all incarcerated people be eligible for good time. They knew that the small reduction of time spent in prison would have a variety of benefits. The ability to reinvest in crime prevention, a better culture inside the facilities, and an overall better outcome and a safer state. Award warning journalist, Nancy Malone, Malay, Malay. Um, she wrote a book called Life After Murder, where she um, followed five people incarcerated in California, uh, pre-release through their pro uh, parole process and then their um, re-entry. Um, and she said that her research search had taught her that there are some convicted killers who are back out in society and have so much to teach us about rehabilitation, redemption, and about really screwing up your life massively. And then what it takes to come back and what it takes to be a person again and give back to society. People can change, she said. Lillane said she was able to determine that 988 convicted murderers re were released from prisons in California over a 20 year period. Of those 188, she said 1% were arrested for new crimes and 10% were arrested for violating parole. She found none of the 988 were rearrested for murder and none went back to prison over the 20 year period she examined. Each of these categories of crimes you are considering leaving out of good time resent human beings. It's very possible that some of them may not be ready to be released at their good time date if they had one, and they may not be ready to be released at their minimum, but this is hardly true of all of them. Please consider letting the Good time section of our 148 continue as written. Um, I am going to send you an email that has <coughs> links that backs up some of the statements that I make here. Um, but that is mainly what I have to say. I also have to say that this is a very stressful time for me because my husband who is in Springfield has been in lockdown total lockdown, not modified, since uh, Saturday and will be so until Monday because there was at least one case of uh, positive COVID among the, um, the corrections officers. So it's um, contact with him is a little more difficult. And of course, it's very stressful to be in an eight by 10 room with a relative stranger 24 hours a day, getting the shower every other day. So um, anyway, that's what I have to say. All right, well, thank you for coming forward with your uh, testimony. It's not our, often that we hear um, from offender, offenders' families on the impact of a bill that we're um, looking at. I. Um, very much appreciate it. Are there questions or comments uh, for Meg? Senator White. So I'm, I'm trying to remember, and this isn't a question for Meg necessarily, but I know that she worked really hard with um, us on the, when we did the bill last year, when we put in the um, ability for people over 65 mm -hmm. to, um, and that 
am I, do I remember right that the house took that out? Yes. Is there a way we can put that back? Sure. Someplace? Well, here would probably be the most appropriate place. Okay, I just, because I think that would, um, that would also, while I wouldn't address this issue in particular, it would help to address Meg's, Meg's issue. Yeah. The issue is not just my issue, it's a yeah. well, widespread but, issue, but yes, thank you yes, for yes. bringing that up, Senator But, but I, I, you know, the, there are three things happening here. One is that as of January 1st, people who had been incarcerated for all crimes in Vermont began, began receiving or in good time. It is not, I want to make clear again, there's been some confusion. It's not retroactive. In other words, you're not getting good time for having served 10 years prior to getting, you're not getting that. You're getting, I know you know that. Meg. Yeah. Some people think that they're getting all that occurred good time from back when they were first sentenced. It's, it's effective January 1st. A number of victims groups realized after they were notified that their offenders were um, receiving this earned time off of their sentences, um, <clears throat> felt that they had been um, deceived by the state because the state had certain sentence in mind and they had made plea agreements on those sentences and so that was the reason for the bill. Um, so, uh, the attorney general who at the time was the state's attorney in Chittenden County um, approached me in December um, and wanted a bill to be dealt with this early this session. Now this bill we could do three things. One is um, Texas and Eric can correct me if I got the state. Texas provides earn good time for all offenders, but those who have committed certain crimes are not eligible for early parole as a result of good time. They can earn the good time, but that's their parole date remains the same as it would have been without it. Um, so, as you mentioned, the second um, thing we could do is moving forward, we could um, add good time. And then for these crimes, and obviously then we, or we could do the bill the way it stands. So th those are some of the alternatives the committee will be discussing later on this morning. But um, I realize it does create disparities and so forth, but um, that's the genesis of the bill and um, why we're here. But yeah, I'm always willing to look at the compassionate release. I think that's um, even more um, necessary with the COVID crisis. I mean, but the, the same is true of folks that have loved ones in a nursing home are unable to visit mm -hmm. any of those nursing homes. Mm -hmm. uh, feel mm -hmm. terrible for them uh, that they're stuck in those facilities. So, yes, you may ask you respond. Please. Yeah. Um, if the compassionate release went through, would it also be limited to people that don't, to, well, it couldn't be limited to people that were in that group of crimes because more than likely older people aren't going to be in the other groups. You know what I'm saying? They're yeah. more likely to be there because they're, they're serving long sentences. It's hard to, to describe certain people, but there's many people who, um, it doesn't mean that they, Fence goes away, and it doesn't mean that the housing situation um, wouldn't wouldn't have some kind of qualifications. We've talked a lot about um, having a um, facility, particularly to care. Many of the older offenders are in wheelchairs, and, and you probably know, um, and unable to move or walkers or other devices. They're no longer the danger that they may have been. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, Senator White. If, if, we, if, we, if we didn't do anything with this bill, and so people are earning good time, 
that doesn't mean that they will automatically be released. There's still a hearing, just like a parole board hearing, to determine whether they actually are able to be released. Am I right about that? There's no guarantee that they'll be released no, just because. But if you get good time off of your minimum, then your first date for a parole hearing would be earlier than it would otherwise have been, but there's no guarantee right. that you would be released. And they're not eligible. One of the things we did in Justice for Investment too, and a lot of people have forgotten all the other parts of Justice for Investment that have that will have a, a very positive impact on the system. But one of the things we did was presumptive parole, but listed crimes are not eligible for presumptive. Right. That's a whole bigger list than this list. They're not eligible. We never made them eligible for presumptive parole is that unless there's a good reason, you would be released on your minimum date. These folks in this category would not be that in, in, in terms of are not eligible. So at any hearing, the victims would have the ability to present the reasons yeah. why, am and I right? The, yeah, and the state's attorney and any yeah. others wanted to, okay. are allowed to. Um, I, you know, frequently victims don't have an objection or don't, but um, they're okay. certain that their voices are heard and mm -hmm. as is the state's attorneys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's my understanding of the parole system. As Meg said, there's no guarantee even if your husband was to receive good time that he would be released earlier than otherwise would have been because of the parole okay. hearing. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments for Meg? Meg, I just want oh. to thank Meg for working so hard on behalf of so many um, families. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you very much for sharing with us this morning. Great. Thank you for letting me speak to you. <clears throat> Not a problem. Um, we have Eric on board. Um, you oh, may think... want to, yeah, you may that. leave or you could, but. You, you're welcome to stay. Um, oh, okay. I'll but stay. if yeah. you could mute yourself so that um, we're going to be taking up other issues, we're looking at the bill. So if you could mute yourself, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Eric, um, where are we at with this bill? And I, um, this is the initial markup. I don't think we have other witnesses scheduled. Am no, I, I think correct? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I, th I didn't see any other witnesses on the agenda or uh, going forward. So I think you're right that it's sort of the first chance the committee's had after hearing lots of testimony as to think about what direction you want to go, what uh, markups you might want to do, or um, you know, language changes or or big picture decisions about how you want to move forward. Um, well, would it help for me to kind of toss out a possible couple of yep. points on yep. the decision tree? Yep, that would be good. I thought I saw Senator Baruth, though. Do you want before I say anything? I I, I have uh, I was just going to offer one of the decision tree points, but you will probably uh, cover it anyway. <clears throat> I like that decision tree points. New jargon. DTPs. We used to call like it markup. That. Academic. Right. It just occurred to me for whatever reason that decision tree branches might also work, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think the, the, the initial one, obviously, is that uh, I think there's, you know, the committee has discussed you know, whether or not as a policy matter, you want to um, take this particular group of offenders, remember it's what in the bill is referred to 
as uh, disqualifying offenses, and that's a you know a statutory term that the that the bill defines, and it takes those eight disqualifying offenses and says they're going to be treated differently than uh, other offenses are treated with respect to the good time system that, as Senator Sears mentioned, just went into effect uh, uh, the first of this year under the DOC rule. So the proposal in the bill is that if you if you fit one of those eight disqualifying offenses, there's you know two two ways really that that you would be treated differently depending on whether or not you're incarcerated as of the time the the bill is signed and goes into effect. Uh, and those two ways are first of all, if you are already incarcerated, if you're if you're uh, in DOC custody, when the bill goes into effect, well, then you do not earn good time going forward for any, if, if the reason you're incarcerated is one of those eight offenses. So if you're in jail for a disqualifying offense, then uh, you will not earn good time, essentially. Now that obviously doesn't affect any good time you may have earned in the past under prior iterations of good time or whatever, whatever may have been in effect beforehand, but going forward, uh, you would not earn it. So that's... Uh, I have a question there, um, and it's a question, I suppose, for Eric, but also for corrections. So we're, if we were to go ahead with this as written, it would create a class, a small class of offenders who are currently now, since January, earning time. And then let's say this bill went into effect in April or May or whenever, June 1st, they would, they would have earned a, a slice of time between January and then, and then no more after that. Is that correct? That's the way it's drafted, I believe, yes. Okay, so, you know, this is one of the things I liked about what we passed before was that it was systematic treated everybody the same. And this seems to me a, a, a sort of weird anomaly if we do pass a version of this bill that will be creating this group of people who earned, um, theoretically earned some small amount of time off their sentences and then had it revoked. Um, that just seems very, very, uh, I don't know, complex as a, as a detail. So could I also ask a question? Or yeah. do, do you want to follow I, up I, on that? I'm done, up? I'm done. Because no. I agree with you, it does seem to make it more complex. But <clears throat> so it's earned good time, right? I mean, <clears throat> people don't get good time just because they're there. They're, it's earned good time. They have to... Um, be they have to model no, prisoners or whatever that. No, means. they don't have to be model prisoners. They just don't have. They, the only thing that oh, can right. disqualify them are disciplinary reports of a certain. R nature. Right. I'd, I'd have they, to have Eric go back on what those um, disqualifiers are. But if they act up or are disagreeable in, um, <clears throat> th then they're not necessarily well, earning. Good times are bad bad term yeah. because we, we set it up so that basically you'd get it if you didn't get a, a disciplinary report. And I can't remember the severity of the discipline. And if you don't get one, I guess you're obeying what you're supposed to do, so. Am I correct on that, Eric? Yes, it's the, the phrase. It's not, the it's not um, meritorious good time, it's uh, earned time. Correct, it's long as, and the language is, as long as you're not adjudicated of a major disciplinary rule violation. Okay, okay, I, I get that. But so people who are um, problem problems in the system probably aren't earning good time. Well, it may be. I mean, how do you define problem? They're defining problem by getting a major disciplinary action. Right. Right. Okay. They could have dozens of minor. Or they could be an exemplary, exemplary, uh, okay. exemplary 
participate in programs, do all the things they're supposed to do, and yeah. wouldn't get any more than the person who gets a lot of minors. Yep. Okay. Dallas? So with regard to Phillips' um, piece, with regard to those persons who started getting it on January 1 of this year, I mean, it's not that they will have accumulated very much because they, you know, if this were changed now, <coughs> yeah, after two months or let's, as, let's assume that it, that so, the governor signs it on April 1st. So they'd accumulated one quarter, or yeah. three, three months. So it's not, I, I don't know though, with the speed that the house well, that's <laughs> tends to move, I, I, I think summer's more, practical to think about. Oh, yeah. yeah, that may be true. Yeah. I've decided not to use terms for the house, at least for the <laughs> month of January. <laughs> Do you have your little swear jar there that you put your money in? Yeah, I've decided not to use any of those terms until February 1st. So Round I up. can, I will tell you I th where <laughs> I think I am with this bill. If we're, um, I, I think that um, carving out a group of people is not, we're carving out a group, it's a broad stroke, it's not individuals. And there are individuals within those that might be perfectly um, capable of being released. And there <coughs> might be victims of those people who would agree. And I understand the egregious nature of some crimes, but I believe that I have to have some faith that the parole board or whoever is the hearing board for this release will listen to victims and will take that into consideration. So at this point, I don't want to carve out um, a group of people. Or a group of offenses. It's the we're um, tying the the people that are involved to the offense they committed. And while some of them may be horrific, um, I'm not sure that's the way we should go. So they're at this point. Okay. Well, what about the the tacit agreement between the victim, the state's attorney? and others uh, this was the sentence and now the state has changed the sentence without consultation with the, that's that's the reason for the bill Senator but Davis. there will be consultation with the victims when the time comes up right but the time will be earlier in Meg's right. husband's case it'll be a year and a half earlier than it otherwise would have been time would be earlier I don't know in the winter bottom case I think it was seven years earlier I, as I, I'm just trying to remember the conversation we had with with mm -hmm. that with the other and then the other family where the, the young lady had been uh, sexually molested as a child mm -hmm. her offender would be earlier so Bill so um, on that both both the victims that came forward were particularly affecting for me because the Winterbottom case took place uh, very near my house and we followed it, uh, you know, just in disbelief as it was going on. And the other case uh, didn't happen in my specific community, but when it hit the papers, my daughters were very young and we, my wife and I reshaped our whole policy for how we let our daughters go on sleepovers as a result of that case. Um, and so I, you know, I, I really feel for those people. Um, but I, and, but I have to say that the general principle, I agree with Jeanette. Um, but where I, where I see the logic for the bill, and I asked the Attorney General this on the first day of testimony, if, if it's about, um, breaking faith with the families who were given a plea agreement, 
then why not make the bill uh, not apply to, uh, or, or make it only apply prospectively so that um, people who commit in these categories uh, or, or who, who did com commit these category of crimes in the past and were part of plea agreements that were agreed to, they would not be eligible. But going forward, everyone in this category or this list would be eligible. Um, to my mind, that does two things. It, it preserves the, the uniform principle that everybody's getting it, doesn't require two systems. Um, but it also does carve out crimes from the past where there were understood agreements with families. I thought Mr. Winterbottom was convincing on that point. So that's kind of my, uh, it's not philosophically pure and it's not, uh, I don't think what those victims' families really want, but that's the compromise that I can see making on this bill. Well, you're, just so I understand, you're, position would be those who are already sentenced after the before the effective date of this bill would not be eligible for right and right and those who are sentenced let's say the bill became effective may 1st so anybody who's sentenced after may 1st would be eligible no matter the crime because everyone in the courtroom would be aware of this benefit right because the if, if the driving force behind the bill is really to keep faith with promises that were made to those victims' families, then we can do that. But prospectively, though, those um, covered offenses, the families of, of future victims should be made aware as a matter of course that earn time will be uh, a potential for the person subject to the plea deal. Can I um, respond? No, before you, oh. can I just respond first? And yeah. Then you can respond. Of course. Uh, I, I, that was a, you know, that, that is a definite piece of the tree um, and a choice we could make. And I had um, the argument that the victim wasn't aware or the state wasn't aware um, would kind of go away um, in those cases that are one of the most difficult parts of the bill was deciding whether to go retroactive, whether to go retroactive to the beginning of their sentence, whether to go retroactive. We decided that we would do it um, not retroactive, but effective of January 1 of this year. So um, that I, I can understand that. There are the other alternative that I mentioned earlier was that, again, Eric, I think it's Texas that provides earned time, but does not change the parole date for certain offenders. I yes, don't know how right. that all works, but you know, it seems like that um, allows them to continue to earn that good time, but does not provide them an early avenue for release. They would still have to wait um, in the Montgomery case, you'd still have to wait whatever it was, the seven and a half years, um, even if you earn Senator White, you wanted to um, respond to Senator Bernice. Yeah, I, I um, actually don't like that solution. And the reason is we're saying that people who, first of all, I, I guess I would <clears throat> question if every single person who's incarcerated in those um, areas that there was, uh, it, it was it, the kind of crime where there would be a, a, an understanding between the victims and the state's attorneys and everything around the plea agreement. Did, did, were, does all, do all of those crimes have that kind of, of agreement or do some? Because if, if there wasn't that um, kind of, victims agreement and the family's agreement, then why would we say that um, they're being um, hoodwinked here because they are being led down a different path? So what I would say is that when, when in crimes like that, and I, I was very 
taken by their their testimony and I felt really kind of um, unclean about what, what had happened to them. It was so horrific, but I, when the time comes for their hearing, they will, they will have a chance to present that to the parole board. And, um, but, but I don't know how many people are incarcerated right now under those crimes. But if what, what we're saying is that we believe that every single one of them had some kind of an arrangement and a, uh, with the family and the victims around um, what they could expect. And I'm not sure that that's true. So I, well, I don't know why we would carve out well, uh, this. I would say, well, I do. Um, because 99.9% .9 of all convictions are based on a plea agreement. And part of that plea agreement is how long that individual might serve. Um, so I, I would prefer to look at what are the qual dis what are the disqualifying crimes, and if we've got the right crimes, are there crimes in this list that shouldn't be in this list? <clears throat> because you might somebody in the Romeo and Juliet case. You talked about a case in um, I think it was Wyndham County. I don't know where everything happens in Wyndham County. Sometimes that was a case where. A young man had a relationship with a young girl who was statutory rape. He ended up on sex offender registry, et cetera, et cetera. The two of them yep. ended up getting married. They have kids, blah, yep. blah, blah. But he's still the offender of this person. And I obviously, um, if he were still incarcerated, that would be kind of a, a miscarriage of justice because the, it was all based upon those types of things. But Many times victims make agreements because they don't want to be re-victimized on the stand by a defense attorney with all due respect to our good friend, Senator Benning. Um, so they do make deals uh, based upon not having that victim come forward. And it may be that the victim doesn't want to come forward um, at the um, parole hearing either. Um, and be re-victimized. There's a lot of, particularly with child sex assault victims, there's a, 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 there's a lot of, of re-victimization that happens when they have to re-discuss what happened, the traumatic events. So I, I guess that would be my reason for <coughs> suggesting that I could agree with Senator Baruth, but I also could agree with the, with the and I don't know how we need to work, talk it out further um, with, with uh, the Texas model. Alice? Yeah. So um, I, I am not wanting it to be retroactive uh, at all. What I see with number five, which was the LNL with a child, that that could be that, um, you know, teenage deal, except more expansive than what's in the law already. And so I can see working on that to take that out or do something else with it. But definitely I'm not interested in um, letting people who are get retroactive who are in there already. I'm not worried about the group that has the, you know, if, 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 the new, if a new bill didn't go into effect until July 1, I, I'm not worried about those people who started getting good time January 1 and are getting it on July 1. You know, and the other thing is, I, I really, I'm wondering in court, will anybody, if we have this um, going forward even, will anybody really be able to calculate the time without the expert um, prison math person coming in to know when someone will actually <coughs> get out? That, I mean, they could never figure it out before. I don't see why they'll figure it out now. Well, I think that part of the reason that we did it the way we did it, and that was unless you had a major discipline or they couldn't figure it out. Part of the reason they couldn't figure it out before was because you had so many qualifiers and disqualifiers, as well as there were two or three different um, systems. Right. So I think that was what made it so difficult. I think this is, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, last year when we did this, corrections kept saying, keep it simple, keep it simple. 
don't don't have it. And I, Erica, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they it's fairly easy to calculate. The winter bottoms calculated and Meg calculated a year and a half. The winter bottoms calculated, I believe it was seven years in some period of time. So. I think it's seven days a month, right? Under the yeah, right. right. So if you just if the what? sentence is a year, you're going to get seven times twelve. Well, I I think that that's right in general, but I do take Alice's point. We did have a lot of testimony about how eventually the system got right. wrapped up in its own complexities, and they couldn't project specifically. Sometimes couldn't even calculate. Um, properly and got sued, as I remember, a number of times about it, so. Yeah, there was a lot of litigation. Yeah. But it isn't um, when they get out, uh, what, Alice, what you said is when they get out. It isn't when they get out, it's when they're eligible for a hearing. That doesn't assume that they're going to get out at all. And on many of these, I would think, horrific crimes, they, the parole board will act responsibly and they may not they won't get out some of them will some of them won't but but i would i, I we heard from two two um witnesses who were victims and i would i would bet that every every uh, victim who is every person or family who is a victim of the crimes in those categories would not um agree that they should not um, be receiving. So I don't know where we draw the line right. because my well, guess is that some victims will are um, willing to have that hearing. But I think you could find a number of other victims. We, don't, I mean, this Zoom doesn't make it as easy as it used to be. To, right. Uh, well, but and I think people, um, you know, obviously they're. I'm sure there are dozens of other witnesses who didn't come forward for a variety of reasons yeah. who have been victims of serious uh, on both sides, probably. Maybe. Senator Benning. Um, first, a couple of clarifications, Eric. As of the first, the good time bill we passed last year. Has that not created a vested right in individuals who now have that applied to them? I think that's an argument that that uh, <coughs> uh, say the the officer prisoners' rights or whoever might be representing an inmate could make uh, that uh, at least you mean going for beyond like let's yeah, say between the first and whatever date this would become effective. Um, it seems to me that there's a vested interest there. I'm already getting signals from the Defender General that it would be litigated. And I'm, I'm looking for your opinion on how that group of people that fall into that time period uh, would be treated. Um, it's just something to put in the mix, I guess. I you may not have an answer right now, but. Jeanette, I want to go back to a comment that you made earlier, and I've been thinking a lot about this since the one witness we had who was a victim used the term victim's sentence. And that really struck me hard. And the more I thought about it, as a defense attorney, one of the things that we are held responsible for is not properly explaining to our clients what the exact ramifications are of a plea agreement that we are entering into. The state has spent a great deal of money on a class of individuals called victims advocates who work in the state's attorney's office. And the state's attorneys themselves, along with their victims advocates, it would seem to me have a responsibility of knowing how to calculate out in time what the victim's sentence might actually be. And that's something else to throw into the mix of this conversation. I'm not sure where I'm standing on this bill right now. I'm literally on the fence and I'm trying to decide how best to move forward. 
I'm concerned initially that there's a class of individuals out there right now between January 1st and whatever day this might become effective has indeed gotten a vested interest. I'm not sure how that pans out in my own head, uh, but if we go and pass this legislation, I would probably be more in favor of having it prospective in order to avoid whatever vested interest there is right now with people that have made assumptions. And I know that that has an impact on existing victims. That part troubles me. But whatever we end up doing, I have to remind myself that if defense attorneys are held responsible with their clients to make sure they understand a plea agreement, because if they don't, that literally enables them to petition the court for post-conviction relief and could overturn the entire plea agreement process. Uh, it seems to me that whatever we do in this situation, there is an obligation for prosecutors, along with their victims advocates, to have a clear sense of explaining to victims exactly what's going to happen in the future. I don't think there's any way for victims to be able to avoid a hearing um, unless you have a straight sentence, but this means that the prosecutors are going to be apt to not offer something lower than what the victims are comfortable with when entering into a plea discussion. These are all the thoughts that are roaming around in my head and I'm, I'm expressing them now only to say, I, I, I've got to consider all this in the mix. I'm not sure where I'm gonna end up with it. On page three of the bill as introduced, uh, item five at the bottom clearly states how this would work for those an offender who's serving a sentence for disqualifying offense on disqualifying offense. So not any good time reductions under this section after the effective date of this act, subject shall not be construed to limit or affect good time that offender had earned on or before the effective date. So it envisions that let's say it was six months, the offender is eligible for um, about 42 days, I think my math is. Senator Baruth. Uh, I just wanted to ask Joe a question to be sure I understand what he was saying. Were you saying, Joe, that you, that you that the the group of people in this list who started accruing on January, you w would support a version of the bill that allowed them to continue accruing indefinitely into the future but not anybody sentenced after the effective date. Yeah, I think that's where I'm going. Okay. That's, in a way, that's not quite the reverse of what I was saying, but yeah, sort of. I'm actually with Senator Baruch personally on, on that one. Although I would, I would support, I think, and I think there's things that we need to look at, but it's certainly that we've got the right offenses that we haven't... Um, added an offense that would um, create unintended consequences. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with first degree murder and pretty comfortable with aggravated sexual assault, but I think we have to look carefully at the other offenses. Dick, second, you, were, you weren't calling for a vote on this today, were you? No, God no. Okay. Um, second, I would like Eric to explore the Texas model and how that would work if we were to try that. Yeah, I can look into that. Um, we could get a little more information on Texas to how they do things. I hate copying Texas, you know, <laughs> but they may have this one right. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I could, I, I'm not as worried about somebody in the future who was able to earn good time because then the state's attorney and I'm with Philip and everybody else would know what the rules are. What we did was we changed the rules of the game in midstream. And that's what we have the objection to, frankly. And we didn't, 
um, and we heard, when we did it, we heard from the victims community, we heard from others, and we didn't get this objection. It was only after people were notified by the Department of Energy that they started to get objections. Um, I heard from a former senator who was a victim of a violent crime. Um, Joe did as well, and I talked to her. Um, and uh, I, I remember serving with her and, and working on bills right here in judiciary. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I can, I really have a great deal of sympathy for those victims. And uh, she kept saying, I don't understand why the victims community didn't um, say anything. Um, that was troubling to her, knowing the system as well since so she'd been a member of this community. Yeah, Dick, I, I want to say I'm not wedded to any position right now. I'm very sympathetic with her. In fact, her event occurred on my birthday. Oh my God. And, um, so I, that I'm sympathetic to her position, and I'm just trying to scope out all the particular angles on how this could impact people and what kind of litigation could surface as a result. So I'm, I'm just being contemplative, as they say. I understand. I understand, and it's a difficult move. I first think we have to get the qualifying offenses right, that we're comfortable with that's what we should be doing. Secondly, I think we have to um, decide how to deal with those who are currently incarcerated, um, who have, who, whoever they are with the disqualifying offenses, how we deal with them, and then how we deal with folks going forward. I think we've form the tree and its branches, Eric. There may be other little shoots coming off of the tree. What do you call <laughs> those things? Yes. If I could just follow up just on the on the litigation point that Senator Benning was raised, just to kind of so people understand what the issue is there. I think again, sort of separating uh, the type the, the the point in time and when the bill would go into effect, as you were discussing, let's just for the sake of argument, say July 1st. Uh, so yes, as the bill says, uh, anybody, any good time that a person has earned until July 1st can't be taken away. Under the bill, that's true. And I think under under the state of the law, that would be the case anyway. You know, there's a, there's a legal provision in uh, Title I of the Vermont Statutes Annotated that talks about how a, a right that someone has accrued prior to the change of a law can't be taken away. So obviously if someone had earned a good time already, uh, I think there'd be a number of arguments, uh, statutory, constitutional, otherwise. You don't have to worry about that so much because the language that Senator <coughs> Sears read from it clearly says, you're not gonna take away any good time that somebody has already earned. The question is, well, what is that right that has, has accrued to someone? Is it a, just a right to what they've already earned or is it the right to earn good time forever, essentially, you know, as long as they're incarcerated, can they continue to earn good time? And is the, would this bill be, well, it certainly would be taking that away, but have they accrued a vested right at that point? That's something that, as you pointed out, Senator Benning, is likely to be litigated. I don't have an answer for it. Um, something that the courts would have to answer, but it shouldn't be a surprise that, that it would be subject to litigation. I'd like to have Matt back in have this well, out. The yeah, the next time we mark up, I would like to have Matt, the Attorney General, um, the state's attorneys, and um, any other groups that have that should have like uh, the victims, um, the network, and Center for Crime Victim Services, and the network against mm -hmm. domestic assault. I'd like to have them all here to be in the room so that we can have a discussion about it. But I, it, it would be helpful to me um, if in between the t that time we had a better understanding of particularly um, the, the qualifying offenses, the Texas model, and how it would look under the Baruth model <laughs> well, no, seriously, I, I think it's, you know, 
that does have the benefit of saying, yeah, everybody's eligible, but um, in the future, but at that point, everybody's on the same page. The victim knows, the state knows, the, the defendant knows, everybody's aware of what this might, might happen. So, so can, can we get a, you just asked if we can get a better explanation of the Texas model, because I don't understand if they give good time, but it doesn't um, qualify them for early hearing. I didn't quite understand that. It doesn't qualify them. It doesn't change their parole date. So then what good is it? Date. Well, I think it would be probably, you could argue that they have been of good behavior for whatever period. I don't know. So I, oh, I, okay. I that's why I asked Eric to look at okay. the Texas model yeah. and maybe it takes time off the max. I don't know, but if you're max okay. of life, then that wouldn't do you much good. Uh, yeah, I didn't understand if, if you that. were if you were sentenced to um, twenty to forty years and you were taking time off the forty years, then that would be. I I, I suspect that's what it was, but I think it also gives them um, an incentive to you know to report to the parole board. They didn't have any this 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 for a certain amount of time. But we can you know we need to find out more about it. I don't. Yeah. All I know is that that's a state which has many states about, I think the information, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, about half the states have qualifying, disqualifying crimes. Uh, honestly, I hadn't heard that, Senator Sears. The, the only three that I uh, noted were Maine, which does it in a similar way to H, uh, S18. They have a, just a list of offenses that don't qualify for good time. Uh, Oklahoma uh, also does it in a different way that um, the amount of good time you can earn varies based on the based on the nature of the offense. So more serious offenses earn less good time. And then Texas is the one that that you just mentioned that uh, you know it doesn't it doesn't move up your parole eligibility. They also have another feature that for certain listed listed offenses, you have to serve at least half of the sentence before you start earning good time. That's another thing that Texas does. So uh, obviously that there- would, Yeah, that would complicate it even more. Right. Hmm. But I can, I can certainly put a little more detail on their approach so that you can have yeah. that before we take it up next time. Yeah, and are there other things that people would like to look at so before we take this up again? Because we're going to take a break and then come back and meet with the House Judiciary and House oh. Corrections and Institutions Committee. I just wanted to second Jeanette's uh, suggestion about compassionate release being put into this. Um, it, did I hear that right, that we were considering that? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the language that we agreed on or that we voted out last time, mm -hmm. um, I thought made all kinds of sense. I don't see why we wouldn't put it in here. Right. Can we um, go over the letter from Eric about trials? If we do, you have enough direction, Eric, for the next time? Yes, I just want to make sure that a. Uh, um, clear sort of where we're at. Did you, is the idea that you want to take a look at, for example, an explanation of the Texas system, think about, because um, I think the three three points you were mentioning, Senator Sears, on the, on the decision tree are, you know, how do you deal with the group of offenders who are incarcerated now? Yep. How, do, how do you deal going forward prospectively with uh, good time going forward? Do you, do you make the, a carve out as the bill does for people going forward. And if either one of those things are, are true, how do you deal with the, the disqualififying offenses? Right. Do those still seem like- uh, Yeah, I, I think the important thing is to have a really good discussion of the disqualifying offenses if we've got the right offenses there. Right. Yeah. Um, 
you know, so when the, first started, the, I mean, if we, when we first started the discussion, when I first had the starting the discussion with um, the attorney general, we were talking murder, aggravated sexual assault, and I can't remember manslaughter was in there or not in there, but that those were the ones that we were really focused on. And then we, you know, it broadened as the bill was introduced. Right. So it sounds like at this point, it, it might be helpful to revisit that with the attorney general as to exactly what, why these offenses are included in the bill. Sure. But and then, and then the other, um, looking at the Texas model, but those are the decision tree points. Do we do the Baruth model and just do it for a current? Do we do the, do we do compassionate release? I believe Bryn drafted that. Um, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, you could just grab her draft of what we passed last year. Senator Nitka. I'd rather we didn't put compassionate release in here. Right. But what it's worth. Well, we um, I think Senator White and Senator Ruth have both expressed a desire to have that discussed and can make a vote on it. So would you, Senator Zears, would it be, are you thinking that you want to have another draft that sort of highlights maybe uh, within the draft what the questions are? Would that sort of- No, I, I think, no, I think we don't need, we didn't need another draft unless you were willing to draft the Texas model and what that would be. I think I'd want to look at it first and see, yeah, yeah. and then I could certainly, I'll send out a summary maybe, and then you can look at it and decide. Yeah, maybe it'd be better to do a summary of that. I don't think you need to do another draft. I think, I think what would be helpful is a better explanation of the qualifying crimes. Okay. That, that would be helpful with, it. you know, what are the elements to prove aggravated sexual assault? example, over mm -hmm. sexual assault. What are the elements of being lascivious with a child? Um, Sounds good. I mean, I think we all understand kidnapping. Manslaughter can be a variety of stuff. Am I correct? Pardon me? Manslaughter has a variety of um, elements to it. Right. <clears throat> okay. Can we briefly discuss the letter that Eric, the beautiful, I'm going to sound like the former president, the beautiful letter that Eric wrote. <laughs> Everybody it likes to, it. <laughs> send it to Kim Jong un. <laughs> Where are you seeing it? Did we, we received it on an email, but are you seeing it? I didn't print it. So. Peggy, can you post? Um, can you? Share it, please. I I read it on email. I thought it was quite the elegant letter. Oh, thank elegant. you. Elegant, that's a good word for it. <laughs> I did too. I also thought it's probably not going anywhere, but you can and send our, it And our former president didn't use elegant. No. <laughs> he didn't but, know that word. Well, but I believe that there's, um, that the, uh, the judiciary has looked at the letter, uh, or at oh. least has looked at the issues that we raised. Yeah, I think they're they're in the midst of looking at it right now, and uh, uh, think it's making good progress, from what I hear. Who's looking at it now, Eric? The court. The court opening team. The is it oh. court opening or court reopening or whatever? It is. I think it's jury restart or something. Oh, jury, yeah. Whatever that team is that they have. Mr. Chair. Yes. Just one question, and it's kind of about where the committee landed. So as I remember, the, the plaintiff's bar was uh, firmly behind a six-member jury idea. Yep. The, the defense bar, as they said, had opposed that. Then when, when I asked, I think I asked uh, the person representing the defense bar, and they, they were a little less definite about opposing it, but the letter, I think, makes it seem as though we're proposing six-member juries 
or, or that we prefer that as an option. I, I am okay with that. I'm just wondering if that was where the committee landed. Well, I'm okay with six minutes. Is uh, maybe my question is for Joe. Joe, are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with it. I don't do civil work, so. <laughs> no skin off my nose. If you, were, if you were talking criminal, I'd be leaping off the, the chair I'm in, but well, civil is. I think civil. we all recognize the right to a solid jury. Okay, question so it, what would if, if we um, allow six person juries, would the defendant um, have the ability to object to a six person jury and um, request a 12 person? Or would it just be they take what they get? Currently, you can have less. I remember, Eric, correct me. If the, par the parties can certainly agree to less than 12, yes. I believe in the only suit I've, civil suit I've ever been involved in, we ended up with eight jurors. But if we allow six person, do they have the ability to request more? I think it's important to remember here, it's not that you are allowing anything. You're just, oh. you're making a suggestion for the court to issue a rule about something. Oh, so, okay. So it sort of would depend on how, how the rule came out. Okay, yeah, right, got it. Okay. I think we're, I'm good with it. I'm good with it. Okay, yep. Yep. Eric, good job. Thank you. I'll, uh, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, it hadn't been edited or proofed yet, so I'll send it to our, our uh, editorial staff and, uh, and then I'll let you know when it's finalized. Okay, and then Peggy can post it on the web page. Should we do it now or wait? Since we brought it up in public, I guess you can post it now. And then if it gets re if it gets changed by the editors, then we can post the official. Yep, that's, that's is, easy. Is enough there a way for you to put draft on it, Peggy? Um, I. I can try. I, I, I think can do Eric it. can do it. Yeah. Yeah. I and can I do think it. Eric yeah, yeah. Just put a draft on it and then post it. Yep. yep. That's that's doable for sure. Okay. Well, we've got 17 minutes before we go to the next Zoom. But it's a different 